The documentary film you are about to see was shown to Mr. Alexander Kerensky, president of the Democratic Provisional Government of Russia, overthrown by the Communists in 1917. Mr. Kerensky consented to make a few introductory remarks about our picture. We present 80-year-old Alexander Kerensky in his New York City apartment on October 10th, 1962. Ladies and gentlemen, in a few minutes, you will see the documentary movie of the development of communistic movement throughout the world. The majority of this uh, audience is too young to remember that this communistic movement began in 1917 during the first war in my country, in Russia. I was, uh, in this time, leader of this provisional government of Russia. When uh, uh, you look this film, keep in your mind that uh, Russian people were the first victim of the communistic tyranny. I think that is now uh, is time to study the communistic movement and to understand it, not by different uh, legend created during these long years, but by the documentary sources as, for instance, this film. <laughs> Most of the pictures in this documentary were photographed by communist cameramen as the actual events were taking place. Communist narrators interpret some of the scenes. The words of the communist leaders are their own. In the traditional motion picture story, the villains are usually defeated. The ending is a happy one. I can make no such promise for the picture you're about to watch. The story isn't over. You and the audience are part of the conflict. How we meet the communist challenge depends on you. What has happened so far, what is happening now, is far from encouraging. Less than 50 years after the communists seized power in Russia, almost a billion people are under their control. Four out of every ten of the world's population oppressed. And the conspiracy that is communism is stronger, more determined than ever, growing in the image of its leaders. Nikita Khrushchev says, in this world today there's a fierce struggle of two ideologies, the communist and the capitalist. And in this struggle there can be no neutrals. Whether you like it or not, history is on our side. We will bury you. Mao Zedong says, coexistence with capitalism is impossible. Warfare with these forces is inevitable. Fidel Castro says, socialism, communism, is a world reality today. There is no halfway between communism and capitalism. Their target is us, our institutions, our religions, our families, our children. Karl Marx, who developed the basic theories of communism, was a sick man most of his life. Sick in body and spirit. He once said, the capitalists will pay for my carbuncles. We have. Karl Marx believed that capitalism, as he saw it in the 19th century, was stagnating, beginning to decay. 
and that communism was predestined to replace it, starting with the highly industrialized nations like Germany. That was just one of his many mistakes. Actually, it took the misery, the disillusionment, and the slaughter of World War I to bring the first communist regime into power, not in Germany, but where Marx least expected it, Russia. In 1917, Europe is entering its fourth year of war. Karl Marx has been dead for 34 years, but one of his most fanatic disciples, the Russian Bolshevik Vladimir Lenin, is in exile in Switzerland with 13 devoted followers. On the eastern front between Germany and Russia, within the once proud Tsarist armies, corruption, hunger, and enormous casualties have taken their toll. Rioting flares in Petrograd, where the people demand bread. Imperial Russia dies as Tsar Nicholas abdicates in March. His future? Soviet bullets and an unmarked grave. In Germany, grasping for victory in the East, Field Marshal Paul von Hindenburg spirits Lenin across Germany in a sealed freight car. Lenin arrives in Petrograd in April and preys on the poverty, ignorance, and desperation of the people. He promises them land and peace independence for non-Russian peoples, and a red heaven on earth. In July, he leads an uprising against the provisional coalition government, which fails. Alexander Kerensky becomes the new premier. On November 7th, October 25th by the old Russian calendar, troops of the demoralized army and navy under number two Bolshevik Leon Trotsky seize the Winter Palace and destroy the coalition government. Kerensky escapes. Lenin controls Russia. The Bolsheviks change their name to communists. All opposition is ruthlessly suppressed. It is immediately apparent that the dictatorship of the proletariat, the working people, which Lenin had promised, is a myth. The dictatorship is that of the Communist Party under its chairman. Lenin makes a humiliating peace with Germany to gain time to establish his regime. First, he creates a terrible weapon against counter-revolution secret police battalions, and then builds a new war machine under the guidance of Commissar of War, Leon Trotsky. Lenin makes it clear that his brand of communism requires an absolute dictatorship. Chief of the Petrograd Soviet, Grigory Zinoviev, soon to become the first president of the Comintern, the Communist International, predicts the future developments of the world revolution will proceed at the same pace as the march of our Red Army. Lenin prophesies, communism side by side with capitalism for a long time is unthinkable. One or the other must triumph in the end. And before that end comes, a series of frightful collisions between Soviet Union and capitalist states will be inevitable. By the summer of 1922, Lenin suffered a stroke. Russia, a catastrophe. With private property abolished, factories are idle, communications chaotic, farmland fallow, Bolshevik hopes are dying in squalor and misery. When under the direction of Herbert Hoover on the left, $60 million worth of food from the United States arrives to feed the starving Russian peasants. This act and Lenin's return to limited free enterprise saves the Soviet state. Exercising power for the ailing Lenin are Zinoviev and Lev Kamenev, forefront on the podium. In the background, the shadowy new secretary of the Communist Party, Joseph Stalin, is still relatively unknown. January 24, 1924. Vladimir Lenin, who vowed to destroy the free world, is dead, and a sordid struggle for power begins. Scheming to destroy the image of Trotsky as Lenin's successor, the triumvirate Zinoviev, Kamenev, and Stalin telegraphed Trotsky on his way to Sukhim, a health resort. The funeral takes place on Saturday you will not be able to return on time. The Politburo thinks that because of the state of your health, you must proceed to Sukhim. The funeral actually takes place on Sunday. Trotsky proceeds to Sukhim. Stalin proceeds to power. Using his position of party secretary to staff key positions with his henchmen. He rids himself of his opposition, Trotsky, who is exiled to Turkestan, then with his family to Turkey, and finally to Mexico. His son, Sadov, is later to be poisoned by the Soviet secret police. 
it is again apparent that communism requires an absolute dictatorship to survive. The dictator, Joseph Stalin, and he builds a cult of personality probably unrivaled in history by anyone except Adolf Hitler. Stalin creates an image of himself as a demigod. A man of the people, the source of all goodness, all wisdom, all love. Watching the proceedings are Stalin's underlings, Grigorio Orzanikidze, Anastas Mikoyan, Vyacheslav Molotov, and Lazar Kaganovich. Stalin is pictured as Lenin's closest disciple. The revolution's greatest general, communism's most profound thinker, the great educator. The communist narrator says, Operators, lorry drivers, hydro mechanizers and others are studying the economic laws discovered and substantiated by Joseph Stalin. The guardian of hearth and home, a hero for children to worship. Stalin is very much aware of one of communism's primary objectives, to capture the minds and hearts of the young. Now he gives great attention to the Komsomol, the Young Communist League, whose aim is to link every step in the training and education of youth to the class struggle, the victory over the non-communist people of the earth. Now the world begins to learn the truth about communism. Family ties are discouraged. The state is supreme. Translation, religion is the opiate of the people. Religious satires are staged throughout the Soviet Union. Atheism continues to be the official state doctrine. Communism instructs its people, never forget the clergy are the greatest enemies of the Soviet state. If you are not a convinced atheist, you cannot be a good communist and Soviet citizen. Atheism is inseparable from communism. Both of these ideals form the foundation of Soviet power. Teachers find that 40% of their course is made up of indoctrinational studies. Indoctrinators are guided by Lenin's instruction, children must be taught to hate their parents if these are not communists. For sons of the new class, military training begins early. Communism believes that its struggle to win the world will be a violent one. In 1928, Stalin puts Trotsky's five-year industrialization plan into effect as his own. He initiates a series of so-called judicial trials that will last for 10 years, providing scapegoats for his many failures. And he begins the forced collectivization of agriculture. Stalin declares the Kulak, the independent farmer, an enemy of the state. Whole villages are uprooted. Six million farmers are liquidated. 25 million farms erased. The most violent social upheaval in history as Stalin forces the peasant population into huge collectives. Production declines and once again, as in Lenin's time, starvation is the diet of communism. Freight cars are used for housing. 
Stalin makes slavery an essential part of the communist economy. Here, digging the Volga Don Canal are farmers, religious leaders, and inconvenient minorities. Stalin establishes his own secret police force and slave labor camps are set up all over the Soviet Union. 125 camps, 10 million slaves. On the backs of his slaves, Stalin builds an industrial Russia geared for conflict with the West. 1934, Stalin plots to liquidate his opposition within the party. He confides to his friends to choose the victim, to prepare the blow with care, to satisfy an implacable vengeance and then go to bed. There is nothing sweeter in the world. On the right is Sergei Kirov. Stalin uses the assassination of Kirov as the excuse for the great purges which claim thousands of lives. The first to go, Lenin's close associates. Zinoviev executed. Kamenev executed. Radek executed. Piatikov executed. Leon Trotsky comments from Mexico. There are no crime in history more terrible in intention or execution than the Moscow trials of Zinoviev Kamenev and Radek Piatikov. What is now my principal task? to reveal the truth, to show and to demonstrate that the true criminals hide under the cloak of the accusers. What will be the next step in this direction? The creation of an American, an European, and subsequent also an international commission of inquiry, composed of people who incontestably enjoy authority and public confidence. Trotsky's future? assassination. In the Kremlin, the planned murders continue. The cream of the officer corps, condemned without witnesses or defense and shot within 48 hours. Literary giant Maxim Gorky dies under mysterious circumstances. One of those benefiting most from the purges is Nikita Khrushchev, now first secretary of the Moscow party organization. He proclaims they, the wormy trash, the Trotskyites, they raised their criminal hands against Stalin. Hail the greatest genius of mankind who leads us victoriously toward communism, our own Stalin. Apparently based on Kirov's reform project, the Stalin Constitution of 1936 provides for universal suffrage and direct election to the Supreme Soviet, in theory, the legislative branch of the Soviet government. In practice, it is actually a rubber stamp cheering section for Stalin. As for the election, there's only one set of candidates, those nominated by the Communist Party. Voting with Premier Stalin are Minister of State Security, Secret Police, Nikolai Yezhov, Minister of War, Clement Voroshilov, and Minister of Foreign Affairs, Vyacheslav Molotov. By himself, Nikita Khrushchev. Everyone, everywhere is ordered to vote. Penalties for failure to vote are severe. They involve loss of work, loss of social position, or imprisonment in a slave labor camp. Supposedly, 99% of the people cast their ballots for the one-party ticket. Stalin announces that socialism has been attained in the USSR. Actually, the government has become everyone's boss. Workers are forbidden to strike. Agriculture is finally collectivized. By 1939, through the tactic of united and popular fronts, the communist conspiracy is truly worldwide. In the United States, a well-financed communist apparatus insinuates its way into American life. Through the Communist International, based in Moscow, Stalin controls the activities of communists everywhere. He establishes a network of spies to steal, for communist misuse, the fruit produced under the system of free men. 
In Paris, communists maneuver their way into the French government. Posing as enemies of fascism, the Reds are able to gain many converts. In Yan'an, China, Mao Zedong is firmly established in the north and awaits his opportunity to take over the whole country. In Moscow, instead of the withering away of the state promised by Karl Marx, the state has become a monster, wholly dependent for its power on the Red Army and secret police. Despite the 20-odd years of Soviet brutality, the objective of the Marxist Communist Manifesto, the World Revolution, has not occurred. And Stalin still waits for the chance to spill communism over the borders of the Soviet Union. His opportunity comes with the rise of a rival tyranny in Nazi Germany. In early 1939, the British and French negotiate in Moscow for a mutual defense pact against Hitler. Stalin instructs his subordinates, words have no relation to action. Otherwise, what kind of diplomacy is it? Words are one thing, actions another. Words are a mask for concealment of bad deeds. Sincere diplomacy is no more possible than dry water or wooden iron. Even as the fruitless talks continue, Nazi Foreign Minister Joachim von Ribbentrop arrives in Moscow to discuss with Commissar of Foreign Affairs Maxim Litvinov a non-aggression pact between Hitler and Stalin. On August 23, 1939, the tyrants are united. Hitler is free to strike. So is Stalin. September 1st, Germany attacks Poland. Two days later, Britain and France declare war, but are powerless to help the gallant Poles. The end comes quickly, but not before the Red Army has invaded the hapless country from the east. Communism has at last advanced outside the Soviet Union and quickly provides the world with a sample of its tactics in occupied territory. Tens of thousands of prisoners are deported to slavery in Soviet Siberia. As the Polish people suffer, the Red propaganda machine goes to work. Із великої Москви, з великого будинку, із хати Червона армія, вона нас оборонила від усього. Вона не дорожила, що покинула семні батьків, жінок, дітей. Орлами летіли на наші землі і боронили. The new secretary of the Ukrainian Communist Party, Khrushchev, and Marshal Semen Timbashenko take over. Meanwhile, Soviet firing squads are busy. In the Katyn forest, some 10,000 Polish officers and intellectual leaders are slaughtered by the communists and buried in mass graves. The atrocities in our film are not pleasant, but the world must be reminded again and again of the inhumanity to man that is communism and was Nazism. After years of vicious attacks on Hitlerism as the scourge of mankind, Stalin now declares, it cannot be denied that it was France and Britain who attacked Germany, thus assuming responsibility for the present war. Molotov is a frequent visitor to Berlin, appeasing Hitler with food and supplies, declaring, it is criminal to wage a war against Hitlerism, camouflaged as a fight for democracy. Taking advantage of the pact with Hitler, Russia begins a series of systematic attacks on its tiny neighbors. Finland is invaded on November 30th, 1939. At first, the heroic Finns repulse the Red Army, weakened by Stalin's purge of its top officers. Later, greatly outnumbered, Finnish forces lose the Karelian Isthmus to the Soviet Union. 400,000 refugees, unwilling to be liberated, flee their homes, moving their possessions by every possible means. Next, the Baltic states. Non-aggression pacts notwithstanding, a Russian ultimatum to Latvia opens the border to red troops.
and hordes of so-called technicians, in reality trained in Moscow agents. From Moscow comes Andrei Vyshinsky to appoint a puppet government with August Kirchenstein as prime minister. Banners and signs prepared by subversives demand admittance of Latvia into the Soviet Union. Johannes Spure of the Latvian Communist Party makes the formal request. There are no opposing votes. To the Kremlin goes Premier Kirchenstein, petitioning for admission into the Soviet Union. With Stalin are Khrushchev, Molotov, Mikoyan, and Kaganovich. Back in Latvia, behind the parades and banners, oppression. The communists have a technique for subversion outlined for every nation, for every class, for every type of political situation. Here is a blueprint for communist conquest. First, the propaganda machine goes into action. Business is nationalized, and all assets become the property of the state. Down to the last nut and bolt. This woman worked a lifetime to save 4,000 Latvian dollars. 3,000 of it is now the property of the party. And so is a month's pay from every worker. Time is taken out to sign the pledges. Farmers must join collectives in order to survive. The jails are opened, allegedly for political prisoners. But convicted felons become the new police force. Translation, criminal album. Anna's Yanis, 11 sentences for felonies, released from prison June 21st, becomes inspector of police. Yanis Businskis, professional thief, serving three years and six months, is made chief of the Red Guard. Sipa Gutmanis, a felon, serving three years and six months, moves up to prefect of the second police district. August Kalman's burglar, serving two years and one month, was promoted to chief of police of Dogopil. Matisse Botanicus, thief, serving two years and one month, is the new chief of police of Liepaja. The new constitution from Moscow guarantees freedom from unreasonable arrest. Previously respected citizens, now labeled enemies of the people, are herded into trains and deported to slave labor camps. While parents are persecuted, great care and attention is immediately focused on the children. A red scarf of communism is supposed to give the character representing the spirit of childhood control over the world. The true meaning of the red scarf of communism is evidenced by this list of 78 Latvians from all walks of life. The notation says, politically unreliable, shoot them to death. There are no trials, no appeals. A mass grave in the courtyard of the Riga city jail. More than 15,000 men, women, and children, educators, doctors, ministers, students, laborers, are executed. It's the same sad story in Estonia and Lithuania. Molotov says, the nonsensical talk about the Sovietization of the Baltic countries is only to the interest of our common enemies. Words are one thing, actions another. Communist imperialism marches on. In Eastern Romania, Khrushchev and Commissar of Defense Temeshenko supervise the Red Takeover. May 1st, 1941, in Red Square, Marshal Timoshenko entertains officers of the Axis powers. It begins to look as if Stalin and Hitler will divide the world. On June 22nd, frustrated by his inability to conquer England, 
and not trusting Stalin, Hitler turns his forces on the Soviet Union. Because Stalin had feared to provoke the Germans, he ignored warnings of a Nazi buildup along his border. Caught completely by surprise, poorly led, and lacking the will to fight, the Soviet armies are decimated. Conveniently ignoring his own treacherous acts, Stalin appeals to the West for aid. Weeks later, he justifies his pact with Hitler to the Russian people in this way. are confused as to exactly who the fiends and cannibals are. In village after village, the Germans are welcomed as liberators, freeing the Russians from the communist yoke. But then comes the incredible barbarism of the Nazi occupation troops. Some people have difficulty drawing a parallel between the brutality of Nazism and the brutality of communism. The victims have no such difficulty. These atrocities and Stalin's appeal to nationalism rather than to communism gives the Soviets a reason to resist, aided by some $11 billion worth of material from the United States. Stalin signs treaties to gain strength, first with the Polish government in exile, represented by General Sikorsky. Then with the Czechoslovakian government in exile, in the presence of his president, Benish. These are just two of the more than 200 treaties and international agreements communists sign and break. General Sikorsky, with the Duke of Windsor representing Great Britain watching, takes charge of the Poles on Russian soil. General Svoboda assumes command of the Czechoslovaks. As the war continues, Stalin becomes Uncle Joe, the faithful ally. With a straight face, he signs a summit agreement which states we look to the day when all peoples may live free lives, untouched by tyranny and according to their varying desires and their own consciences. But in Moscow, he has already established the Lublin Committee, dedicated to a communist Poland after the war. Soviet diplomacy. Words are one thing, actions another. <laughs> While the Russian soldier battles Hitler, his communist leaders fight against freedom. In 1944, they unaccountably halt the Red Advance a few miles from Warsaw, where Polish resistance forces have risen in rebellion against the Nazi occupation. Help us or we die, begged the patriots over the Warsaw radio. But the Red Army stands by, waiting for the future leaders of a free Poland, 200,000 of them to be massacred. And 
and only then do the Reds move in. Stalin takes advantage of the change in the tide of war to satisfy his vengeance on seven of his minority nations whose members may have been disloyal to him. He directs a mass genocide resulting in over 11 million victims. For example, these Tanu Tuvinians, a proud and ancient people completely obliterated, their very existence denied by the Soviet Union. When the war ends, the communists occupy all of Eastern Europe and one-third of Germany. Stalin means to hold his gains. All red-occupied territories are ruthlessly plundered. The example of Mukden, Manchuria, where after six months of red liberation, 5,000 factories are stripped of machinery for removal to Russia. The truth behind Khrushchev's statement, we categorically refuse all that rests on loot, violence, and occupation. Stalin again signs treaties, this one with Chiang Kai-shek's Chinese nationalist representative. As this scene is being enacted, Stalin is secretly supporting the communist leader Mao Zedong, Soviet diplomacy. Meanwhile, special United States ambassador George C. Marshall attempts to restore peace in China. He negotiates a truce between the nationalist government forces represented by General Chang Chun and the communist guerrillas represented by General Cho and Lai. Paper promises, and the Reds gain valuable time to strengthen their forces. When Marshall leaves, they resume the war on a vastly larger scale. By the end of 1949, China falls to the Reds, another 700 million people under communist control. Lenin once said, we shall reach Paris by way of Peking. During this time, 1945 to 49, Stalin has been beating the propaganda drums for disarmament. But his true policy is revealed in instructions given by the communist international apparatus. The disarmament policy of the Soviet government must be utilized to support the only way toward abolition of war, arming the communists, overthrowing the capitalists, and establishing the communist dictatorship. Stalin's policy of a protracted conflict, the Cold War, is becoming evident. With about five million Red Army troops and two million internal security police in East Europe, no one punishes Stalin as he consolidates his control by tearing up previous treaties and signing new ones with his puppets. Romania's Dr. Groza and Dej. East Germany's Grotewald. and peak. Yugoslavia's Tito. Albania's Hudza. In most communist parades and rallies, it's not unusual for the dove of peace to go hand in hand with the reality of war. Bulgaria's Dimitrov, formerly head of the Communist International. Poland's Beirut. Hungary's Rakoshi, who speaks of Soviet generosity. Without the unremitting kind support of the Soviet Union, the Hungarian popular democracy, and I may add all other popular democracies, would never have been created. Czechoslovakia's Gottwald. The Czechoslovakian story, a good example of subversion in action. The great liberal statesman Edward Benish, after seven years of wartime exile, is unanimously elected president of the Second Czechoslovak Republic by the Constituent Assembly. But the communists, a militant handful, force the formation of a coalition government and proceed to split and then wreck the opposition. To emerge the leading party in the cabinet under Premier Gottwald, a meeting of the communist-dominated General Federation of Labor is taking place. The Reds infiltrate the army and the trade unions. Gottwald denounces the anti-communist members of his cabinet. 
Zapototsky, chairman of the General Confederation of Labor, demands a general strike. The delegates vote. Two committee members have the courage to abstain. Work stops. Czechoslovakia is paralyzed. Freedom dies as Benish is forced to accept the resignation of the last anti-communist in the cabinet. And then he too resigns. Foreign Minister Jan Masaryk, a great patriot, still has illusions. It's up to us, the so-called little people, and I personally proudly claim membership in that great mass of thinking and working citizenry. Come along with us, join us. Let's criticize together. Let's make suggestions together. Let's insist on being heard, and actions are bound to follow. Truth shall conquer if we give it half a chance. I'll be Two weeks after the takeover of Czechoslovakia, Masaryk is dead, allegedly a suicide. Benish, who also thought he could do business with the communists, dies soon afterward. To divert attention from his next move, Stalin orders violence in South America. In Bogota, Colombia, Dr. Jorge Gaitlin, Colombia's most popular political leader, is murdered. Communist handbills printed in advance blamed the murder on the government. Within 24 hours, 1,000 dead, 136 major buildings destroyed, the result of the communist incited riot. Unexpectedly, Stalin blocks Allied access routes to Berlin. The flood of refugees fleeing from communism embarrasses him. Stalin conveniently puts aside his solemn promise during World War II for free access to the city. This time, however, the United States stands firm. Thousands of tons of food and supplies are flown into Berlin every day. Stalin is made aware that interference means war. He backs down. The roads are reopened. Mao Zedong arrives in Moscow to participate in Stalin's 70th birthday celebration, December 2nd, 1949. The new Moscow-Peking axis poses an ever more ominous threat to the free world. The communist narrator translates. The most vital tasks at the present time are to fight the warmongers, strengthen good neighborly relations between the two great states, China and the Soviet Union, and thanks particularly to the correct international policy of Generalissimo Stalin. In the Presidium are leaders of the party and government, representatives of the various Soviet republics and of the communist and workers' parties abroad. Khrushchev proudly proclaims Stalin, the genius, leader, teacher, father of the nationalities, great industrializer, great collectivizer, creator of Soviet culture, careful gardener tenderly rearing the human beings in his charge. Nikolai Zvernik makes the introductory speech. To his left are Georgi Malenkov, first secretary of the Central Committee, and Lavrenti Beria, Stalin's Minister of Interior and State Security. Next to Stalin are Mao Zedong, Walter Ulbricht, Deputy Prime Minister of East Germany, and in a place of prominence, Nikita Khrushchev. In preparation for his next move, Stalin steps up the clamor for peace throughout the world. A rash of peace demonstrations breaks out. This is one of them. The communist narrator says, On Berlin's Marx Engels Square, the German youth demonstrate in defense of peace against the remilitarization of Western Germany. The German youth is greeted by the delegates to the World Youth Festival, representing 101 countries. Among those marching are 35,000 young peace champions from Western Germany who managed to get through Adenauer's police court. Two million persons take part in the procession. In the evening, there's a youth meeting on the square. The speech of greeting is made by Walter Ulbricht, Deputy Prime Minister of the German Democratic Republic. 
Youth everywhere are brainwashed. У комунізм свої вітрила щасливий править Волгодон, і непоборна наша сила, яку не взяти у полон. Щолом за це віддати? Звідкільця висіг і хто могутній міг з'єднати серця у, у нас усіх єдина мати і звезда... Communist narrators continue. The artist buries Prorokov's illustrations to Mayakovsky's verses about America. They lay bare the real nature of present-day America with its false democracy. Lynch law, thirst for profits, and the brutalities committed by the militarists. These illustrations won the artist the Stalin Prize. It for us is a... A gay and noisy carnival fills the streets until the early hours of the morning. The people condemn the warmongers, enemies of democracy. In communist North Korea, a nightmare of national brainwashing is taking place. He supervises the work of a group of writers translating the classics of Russian literature and books on the Soviet Union. Among the first books earmarked for publication in the Korean language is a biography of Generalissimo Stalin. And in Moscow, North Korean leaders absorb Soviet techniques. The Korean people are unimpressed. Tens of thousands flee to the democratic south. Korea becomes the Germany of the east. Stalin decides to do what he didn't dare to do in Germany, take control of the divided country by force. June 25, 1950, the North Koreans launch a surprise attack. Their advance is spearheaded by Russian tanks. But once again, the United States stands firm. Stalin miscalculated. The Cold War becomes a hot war. American troops, later supported by forces from the United Nations, hold and then rout the North Koreans. Mao Zedong pours a million Chinese so-called volunteers into the fight. After three years of conflict and negotiations, agreement is reached. Lieutenant General Nam II signs for North Korea. American Lieutenant General William J. Harrison signs for the United Nations. The cost to the United States for stopping the Red Aggression? 135,000 casualties and $20 billion. These are American soldiers, some of the 10,000 prisoners of war senselessly slaughtered by barbaristic communism. And these are South Korean soldiers. And the Reds retain control of the 15 million North Koreans. The Kremlin. Stalin's war, hot or cold, is stymied. He needs scapegoats for his failures. On August 12, 1952, 400 Jewish artists, actors, and writers are murdered. Next, leading Jewish doctors are accused of a plot to poison the Soviet leadership and of working for foreign intelligence. Stalin tells Ignatiev, the then Minister of State Security, if you do not obtain confessions from the doctors, we will shorten you by a head. Stalin instructs, beat, beat, and once again beat. Caught in the frenzy of his purge, Stalin now plans to liquidate his entire inner circle. Molotov, Malenkov, Beria, Mikoyan, and thousands more are threatened. But before the murders can begin, Stalin dies of a stroke. The end of a tyrant. At the beer, the beginnings of a struggle for power reminiscent of the death of Lenin. Again a triumvirate. The heirs apparent are Molotov, Beria, and Malenkov, who now becomes premier. Khrushchev is still in the background, waiting. Within months, the new rulers are shaken by the first popular uprising against a red dictatorship. East Berlin, June 17, 1953. The sign says, we want freedom. 
It starts with workers demonstrating against intolerable conditions and spreads rapidly until people of all classes are demanding democracy and an end to the communist regime. Part of the Iron Curtain is torn up. flag is hauled down over the Brandenburg Gate. The Red Army intervenes. Sticks and stones prove useless against Soviet tanks. For East Berlin, after 13 years of Nazism and eight years of communism, one glorious day of freedom. The red flag goes up. For secret police chief Beria, Berlin sounds a death knell. Khrushchev finally sees the chance to split the triumvirate and take over Beria's police power. Among other charges, Beria is accused of treason by his failure to foresee the uprising and is arrested. Khrushchev says, it has now been established that this villain had climbed up the government ladder over an untold number of corpses. Beria is executed. Now, as secretary general of the party, Khrushchev follows in the footsteps of his predecessors. The opposition, Premier Malenkov on Khrushchev's right, is disgraced and forced to resign. His successor, Nikolai Bulganin, here with Marshal Zhukov, is a Khrushchev puppet. And Khrushchev soon succeeds him. Molotov is banished. Khrushchev staffs key posts with his own followers. Then, in a maneuver that astounds the world, apparently in order to conceal the truth of his connection with the shameful past, Khrushchev turns his attention to the overpowering image of Stalin. This is the 20th Party Congress, where Khrushchev delivers his secret de-Stalinization speech. Comrades, the cult of the individual acquired such monstrous size because Stalin himself supported the glorification of his own person. Was it without his knowledge that Stalin monuments were erected throughout the country? These memorials to the living? Was it without Stalin's knowledge that many of the largest enterprises were named after him? That many of the largest towns were named after him? The communist narrator continues. The inhabitants of Varna, now known as Stalin, voiced their warm affection and loyalty to the great Stalin and the Soviet Union. Khrushchev continues. And when Stalin asserts that he himself wrote the short course of the history of the all-Union Communist Party, the work created by a group into a book written by Stalin, this calls at least for amazement. His short biography is an expression of the most dissolute flattery. We need not give here examples of the loathsome adulation filling this book. They were all approved and edited by Stalin personally. Khrushchev continues. Stalin knew the country and agriculture only from films that dressed up and beautified the existing situation, and so pictured collective farm life that the tables were bending from the weight of turkey and geese. Evidently, Stalin believed it was so. The power in the hands of Stalin led to serious consequences during the war. To his leadership were dedicated many literary works and paintings full of fantasy. When we look at many of our novels, films, and historical scientific studies, they make us feel sick. Khrushchev continuing, all the more monstrous are the acts whose initiator was Stalin. We refer to the mass deportation of whole nations. The Kalmyk Autonomous Republic, the Karachi, the Chechen, English. The Ukrainians avoided meeting this fate only because there were too many of them, and there was no place to which to deport them. Thus spoke Khrushchev. He avoids mentioning the Jews in whose persecution he himself is deeply involved, and Budapest is still to come. October 1956, Budapest, Hungary. The Hungarian Writers Union is attacking the communist government for oppressing freedom, distorting the truth, exploiting labor, and abusing the farmers. Students by the tens of thousands denounce the Soviet occupation. 
they rip the hammer and sickle from their flag. They demand democracy, freedom of opinion and expression, freedom of the press and radio, general elections with a secret ballot. They march to the Budapest radio station to make their program known to the world. The student leaders are arrested and the crowd demands their freedom. Now the AVO, the Communist Security Police, opens fire. The first blood is drawn. The world has a new set of heroes, the freedom fighters, who rally during the night and win the support of the Hungarian army and the local police. Within 48 hours, Soviet troops enter Budapest. The Hungarians have a message for them. Russians go home. Molotov cocktails, a homemade explosive, emphasizes the message. Eventually, the Soviets are forced to lift the siege of the Killian Barracks, where a hastily organized defense under Colonel Pal Malater has withstood a violent assault. The AVO, the secret police, who have barricaded themselves in the Communist Party building are taken prisoners. Political prisoners are freed. One of them, Cardinal Minzetti has been a captive for eight years. Russians go home. Radio Moscow broadcasts the Soviet government is prepared to revise its policy of stationing troops in Poland, Hungary, and Romania. The Red Forces withdraw. Soviet officials and their families start to evacuate the city. For the moment, Hungary is free for the moment. Stalin's statue, the symbol of tyranny, is brought down. The inscription reads, Free Hungarian Radio. The free press rolls. Soldiers and freedom fighters celebrate. Janos Savo, one of the citizen heroes to emerge from the revolution. Malater, now the Hungarian commander in Budapest, and Kildi, the minister of state, are invited to Soviet headquarters to discuss the final withdrawal of Soviet troops. It is a trap. Malater never returns. On the morning of November 4th, Soviet bombers attacked the city, the signal for an all-out assault by the Red Army. Says Khrushchev, you think that the communist system can be maintained only with the help of our armed forces? I would not fight for such a system. The communist system must be based on the will of the people, 
And if the people do not wish this system, let them establish the way of life they think best. But in Hungary, as elsewhere, words are one thing, actions another. As the devastation continues, the Hungarian radio pleads, people of the world, listen and come to our aid, not with declarations, but with force. Your turn will come also if we perish. Listen to our cry and act. Extend to us your fraternal aid. May God be with you. Then silence. The aftermath, death. And again, the inevitable refugees from communist tyranny. Premier Janos Kadar arrives in Moscow for instructions from Premier Bulganin. Khrushchev states, Comrade Janos Kadar is truly above all a revolutionary who is thoroughly dedicated to his cause. He is a loyal communist who stands on international Marxist-Leninist positions, who does not shun questions of class struggle. It is again apparent that communism requires a dictatorship to survive. With the blood scarcely hosed off the Budapest streets, Khrushchev begins to build his own image. He is a man of the people, a smiling, good-natured peasant. He is a man of the world, interested in people and problems everywhere. He meets with Sukarno of Indonesia, with Mao Zedong, and with Fidel Castro. Khrushchev is a peaceful man who sponsors peace organizations throughout the world. The communist narrator says, The International Stalin Prize for the promotion of peace among nations is presented to the Cuban poet Nicolas Guillén. And Khrushchev organizes movements for the abolition of atomic weapons. The truth is something else. The world finds that Khrushchev's brand of communism is no different than Lenin's or Stalin's. He breaks a solemn agreement for no further testing and resumes some 40 nuclear explosions, detonating a multi-megaton hydrogen bomb, the most awesome man-made explosion in history, apparently to frighten the world. Preaching disarmament on his own terms, he maintains the largest standing army on Earth, a constant threat to peace, an ever-present instrument of blackmail. Says his Minister of War, Rodion Malinovsky. Glory to the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, which has inspired and organized all our victories. Working for world peace, the Soviet state shows its ceaseless concern for the army, which has been called upon to stand guard over the gains of the revolution. The peaceful man is dutifully following Lenin's advice. Every peace program is a deception of the people and a hypocrisy unless its principal object is to support, aid, and develop the revolutionary struggle. A smiling, good-natured peasant admonishes, if anyone believes that our smiles involve abandonment of the teachings of Marx, Engels, and Lenin, he deceives himself fully. Those who wait for that must wait until the shrimp learns to whistle. The man of the people restores the League of Militant Godless and founds two universities of atheism. He points out, communism has not changed its attitude toward religion. In this church, these 14-year-olds are forced to replace their communion with a youth oath which swears allegiance to the communist state. And these third grade students are being sworn into the communist young pioneer organization. The children take the oath in answer to the question, are you prepared to give us your entire strength to work toward the noble goal of communism? Khrushchev accelerates the youth program and coordinates it on a worldwide basis, identifying communism with the future. This World Youth Festival, just another instrument of communist propaganda, is taking place in Vienna. The theme, as always, peace. A communist peace. Propaganda is big business for the Soviet Union. Khrushchev's excuse? Our enemies spend vast sums on subversive activities against socialist countries. The truth is, the Soviet Union is paying around $2 billion a year for their propaganda, employing about 500,000 people. 
Moscow spends approximately $2 per free man to be subjugated, as against two cents per person allocated to world propaganda by the free countries combined. The Soviet effort is roughly 100 times as great as that of all the rest of the world. The money to pay for this fantastic propaganda machine comes from the masses under the communist yoke, who work for absurdly low wages to enable their masters not only to dominate them the better, but to also deceive more successfully the masses in free countries. The importance of propaganda to the success of communism was emphasized by Lenin when he instructed every sacrifice must be made, the greatest obstacles must be overcome in order to carry on agitation and propaganda systematically, perseveringly, persistently, and patiently. While Khrushchev believes he can win the world with his policy of peaceful coexistence, in China, where the communist tyranny is the same, the communist objective the same, the destruction of the dignity of man the same, Mao Zedong's conception of achieving the communist goal is different. Again and again, he says, war with the West is inevitable. It is desirable. Meanwhile, in China as everywhere else, communism produces waste, squalor, misery, and death. Thousands challenge the terror of the secret police to flee into British Hong Kong. From the day Mao takes power, the countries along the Chinese frontier are scenes of constant warfare. Communism feeds on its neighbors. In French Indochina, the native desire for freedom is perverted into a war of communist imperialism. Geneva, 1954. Red China's Chou Enlai and French Premier Mendes France sign an armistice that surrenders the northern half of Vietnam, 12 million people, to longtime communist Ho Chi Minh. Like Germany and Korea, Indochina is now half slave, half free. The French leave Hanoi according to the armistice terms. And with them go the inevitable refugees, one million of them fleeing to the south where a constitutional government is being established. The communists take over North Vietnam and red guerrillas continue the war against the South, demonstrating once again that with communists everywhere, words are one thing, actions another. Red Chinese invade and subjugate Tibet. At the first opportunity, the Dalai Lama, the spiritual leader of Tibet, escapes to India, where bloody riots are incited by communists as red troops assert constant pressure along the India-Chinese frontiers. Meanwhile, the red Chinese pose as friends and protectors of new nations, such as Nepal. And old nations such as Albania. And seek to extend communist influence into Latin America. Here in Peking, communist delegates from different Latin American countries meet their hosts, Mao Zedong and Chou Enlai. Their most important success occurs in Cuba. Only 90 miles from the United States, where a brutal dictatorship under Fidel Castro has imposed the yoke of Marxism on the Cubans. Another seven million people trapped behind the Iron Curtain. In Moscow, Yuri Gagarin, Soviet cosmonaut, speaks of the peaceful foreign policy of the Soviet government. Hands off revolutionary Cuba. The Nationalist Congress of Socialist Youth chooses Havana as its meeting place. Delegates are from the United States, China, Canada, and Russia. And the following year, Castro announces I am a Marxist-Leninist and will be one until the day I die. Castro wins a Lenin Peace Prize. In British Guiana, Chetty Jagan and wife head a strong communist party. Everywhere in Latin America, communism feeding on poverty, ignorance and despair seethes and prepares to explode. Student demonstrations and riots, one of the favorite techniques to prepare the way for communist takeover, are ordered from Moscow. In Montevideo, Uruguay, 
communists protest the visit of President Eisenhower of the United States. In Caracas, Venezuela, Vice President Nixon is mobbed and his car stoned by communists. Red riots shake Japan to forestall the visit of President Eisenhower and the signing of the American-Japanese peace treaty. Throughout the non-communist world, again and again, on orders from Moscow, violence. It erupts too in Africa, in the Middle East, and in Europe, in supposed neutral Yugoslavia, in France. But in the communist world, the demonstrations are quite different. Despite the infamous Berlin Wall, a constant stream of refugees proves to the world that communism has never been the free choice of people anywhere. This is a grim tug of war. East German police try to pull this woman back to captivity. She finds freedom. Others find death. Khrushchev insists, the Soviet state has not ruled and does not intend to rule anyone or impose our way of life upon anyone. For Khrushchev, as for Lenin, Stalin, Mao Zedong, and Castro, and as it must be for all communists, words are one thing, actions another. Communist conspiracy is a deliberate and predictable plan of action to subvert the world. A startling story from Lenin in 1914 with 13 followers to the present with one billion people under the control of a comparative handful of communists. In the Soviet Union itself, only 5% of the people are members of the party. The communist philosophy that the end justifies the means has caused pain out of all proportion to the pitiful social progress communism has achieved. And yet it has spread at a fantastic speed and demonstrated a frightening vitality. Why? Two primary reasons, I think. First, it has duped well-meaning people everywhere into thinking that it provided an answer to the economic and social problems of the world. Second, it has not hesitated to use force wherever possible to impose itself on unwilling people and to hold them in abject subjugation. What can we do in the face of this communist threat? Well, for one thing, we can, by example, let the people of the world know that the way of free men provides a surer, happier answer for their problems and the outdated, coercive doctrines of Karl Marx. That freedom, and not communism, is the doctrine of the future. We must remain strong so that we can never be blackmailed by men like Khrushchev and Mao Zedong, and so that we can uphold the hopes of the captive peoples. If, as the communists say over and over again, war is inevitable, then it is sheer folly for us not to make every conceivable political, economic, military and psychological preparation to win. No one knows what the end of the story will be. 
that's up to you